Okay, welcome to tonight's Archaeology Cafe. Um, Maria Nuevo's got sort of a black eye in the opinion of the city, and in particular the opinion of uh, the city newspaper. But if you don't pay attention to uh, some of the false, uh, false things that were spread about this project, we really learned an incredible amount of information about Tucson's history and Tucson's past through the Rio Nuevo Archaeology Program. And a big part of that is due to our speakers tonight, Homer Thiel and Bill Dolly. And I'm just gonna turn the uh, event over th to them. Thank you, Doug, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight, or coming in tonight, as we should. The Rio Nueva project is, I mean, it's a, we're talking about 15 years ago when things got started. It was 1999 when uh, I was one of the people out there going to public meetings and advocating for people to vote for Proposition 400, which was actually pr pr uh, passed in November of 99 uh, with about a, at least a 60% plus positive vote for it. And very soon after that, the city put out a request for proposals and Desert Archaeology put together a really dream team set of, of uh, players. The plan for Rio Nueva was to ultimately bring the Arizona State Museum, the Arizona Historical Society, the uh, Science Center at U of A, downtown as part of a big complex that would also include a <clears throat> reconstruction of the San Agustin Mission, uh, the Mission Garden, a re reconstruction of a portion of the Presidio. It was a very ambitious project and some kind of a uh, interpretive program on Tucson's origins was a critical part of that. So focusing on Tucson's culture, history, and traditions was really what brought the community of Tucson together. We put together a research plan for the archaeology, which was supposed to kick things off. Uh, starting a huge project like this, there's a lot of infrastructure, uh, planning, those kinds of, of activities that need to take place. So the archeological historical work was, was to take place at the outset and that would give time for some of these other things to catch up and, and uh, the project would, would move forward. We spent uh, from 2000 to 2004 uh, was the first phase of, of the project out there. And that was the one where there was absolutely the most in the way of public involvement. I'll just give you some ideas of, of the kinds of uh, scale of, of public involvement there was. When archaeological field work was going on, there were daily site tours. Some 1,500 people participated in those. We had special open houses. Over 3,500 people came to those events. Homer in particular was a very uh, gracious in, in working with volunteers. We had 135 people who came out and got their hands dirty and uh, participated in, in the field work. The work that the State Museum and the Historical Society uh, did was all focused on educational activities. So the <clears throat> Historical Society had a very ambitious program and Kyle McCoy, uh, who was down here working uh, on a degree at the U of A and working at the Historical Society, worked with the archaeology team to put together this, uh, it's called Downtown Underground. It's a, it's a teacher's manual and uh, lesson plan that meets the state's uh, education standards and it was based on the archaeological things that were going on right then in, in Tucson. The other thing that the Historical Society did was to, while we were in the field even, they had a small exhibit in place there and at the end of field work they put together what's become a permanent exhibit. You can still go see it now, but in 2003 they opened up uh, Rio Viejo, Rio Nuevo, and it told the story of Tucson as it came out of, of this project. The State Museum uh, had a program that was focused on a number of the local schools, the elementary schools, and 
There were a lot of activities that brought students from uh, downtown neighborhoods up onto the U of A campus, uh, letting them see uh, the university uh, life going on there. They did a lot of different projects and there's a variety of, of uh, they did oral histories, uh, and some of those are recorded in, in these uh, little books and booklets. They did a calendar that, that again celebrated their neighborhood. So there was a lot to really bring the neighborhood into, uh, the neighborhoods around downtown into the, the program itself. The initial phase of Rio Nuevo ended there in, in 2004. And I think that was one of the disappointments that there wasn't a, a good sort of continuity of those programs into the next round so that they, the, the educational and outreach uh, dropped off pretty substantially there in 2004. There was additional, as Rio Nuevo was being planned, there were, was additional archeology span that was done at the Presidio, which we'll go into in some detail, and then more over on the west side as well. And one of the things that stimulated this particular presentation tonight is this year we will finally be wrapping up the final report on the Rio Nuevo work, this sort of second uh, round of, of work out there, and there will be a public uh, report that goes with that as well. So Homer and I are working on that, and so that'll be coming soon. Tonight, what uh, I would like to try and accomplish here is to, I've got a little, little tiny book up here um, that has the intriguing title of Outside Lies Magic. And it's by a Harvard professor. He teaches a class, and he has for many years, that literally teaches people to go exploring to get out on a bicycle, get out there on their uh, own two feet, wander around urban settings, rural settings, and observe. Just be an intense observer of details and ask questions. What does this power line mean? What does the uh, picking up on, on details like that? Well, there's a lot that that kind of approach can be uh, used in this kind of downtown and surroundings environment where the Rio Nuevo project has taken place. What we'll be talking about tonight is oftentimes below the level that you can see things. So we'll be providing clues and, and uh, that sort of thing as to what lies under uh, the ground. But Homer was going to start us out with some of the major landscape features. I think really thinking about what we're going to be talking about tonight is we're talking about 4,000 years of an agrarian landscape here in, in Tucson and the way that people interacted with that, that landscape when they brought in uh, maize or corn uh, from south in Mexico and started to become agriculturalists. Uh, there's transformations of that environment as more people moved into this valley and had to deal with other communities that also transform the, the environment and the valley that we live in today. So Homer's gonna highlight some of the places that are still structure the landscape even in this modern urban environment. So Homer. When Father Kino came up into the Tucson Basin in the late 1690s, he found the village of Chukchon at the base of what we now call Sentinel Peak or A Mountain. And that mountain has been a central feature for several thousand years. If you were to wander around the slopes on the top of the mountain, you can see bedrock mortars, round holes in the ground where uh, people probably from the prehistoric up into the historic period pounded mesquite beans into flour. And on the side of the, of the A Mountain, there's a giant set of holes, and those are quarries uh, that originated in 1879 when they built the first St. Mary's Hospital. That mountain continues out underneath the floodplain and pushed the water of the Santa Cruz River up. And so that floodplain became very swampy, a Cienega type environment. And that was prime agricultural land beginning back about 4,000 years ago, extending up into the 1930s. And in that floodplain, uh, uh, buried 
up at least six feet deep, you find layers and layers of, of uh, prehistory and history. Off on the sides of the floodplain, you have the terraces rising up. And specifically on the east side, uh, where the terrace comes up near the art museum, that was a prehistoric settlement as well. And one of the things that we found was that the early agricultural village out on the floodplain also extended up onto that terrace. And uh, there was a large Hohokam village all scattered throughout downtown and despite all the modern growth with modern structures and streets and parking lots, whenever you poke around in the downtown area, if you pull up a parking lot, you're going to find uh, the remnants of what was there earlier. As long as it's not a basement, it's probably preserved there. I mean, water was always very important. The Santa Cruz River flowed year-round up into the maybe 1920s, maybe a little bit later. There were springs at the base of A Mountain and also springs over where Carrillo School is. And those provided water for the people that lived here and created a desert oasis. And that's fostered the, uh, the reason why people uh, settled this area. I mean, it, it provided water for people and animals as well as for all the vegetation that was growing here. The history of human settlement in the Southwest, we know people were here in, in the San Pedro River in about 12,000 years ago. We haven't found evidence for Canada Indians in the Tucson Basin, but one of the big findings that we made during the Rio Nuevo project was a small settlement just south of Congress Street, about five to six feet below the ground surface, where we found uh, an early farming village that dates back about 2,100 BC or so. And there were a couple of surprises. I mean, that was a surprise to find these little cluster of pit houses. But when we collected the dirt and threw it in the water and the charred plant material floated the surface, and we handed it over to Mike Bruder to get some maize, corn, uh, some of the oldest corn in the American Southwest. Uh, what else? Well, that is also the place where uh, the, these are small little pit houses they're referred to. They're dug down into the ground surface, a foot and a half uh, deep. These things are only about 10 to 12 feet in diameter. And so very, very uh, unpretentious places. And what also came out of the ground there was very tiny ceramic shirts, pieces of pottery. So prior to the Rio Nuevo project, we didn't even know that they were making pottery prior to, the, say, the first century or so AD, and even that was a fuzzy boundary there. And now we've got agriculture, early maize being cultivated, pit structures, people living in at least uh, seasonal communities uh, down there in the floodplain, and ceramics are added to that as well. And the growing of Born in the floodplain down there. Um, we're in the middle of a, of a 15 or more year drought here, so we truly appreciate how uh, dry it's been lately. Um, the growing crops in that kind of environment is almost always requires irrigation. We don't know how early they started to irrigate crops, but the earliest canals that we can uh, date by their the, geologic strata that they're in down there are about 1500 BC or 3500 years ago. So we're getting the, the uh, growing of maize and the, the use of irrigation canals coming fairly close together. 500 years in prehistory, but not a very long time. One of the things that uh, our paleo botanists noticed was that early on they were, besides the corn, they were eating a lot of the weedy crops that uh, were growing up as they were picking up their fields. The baby plants would come in, they would collect the seeds and eat those. But through time, as the corn became more important, those seeds became less of the Remember that maize was not a low foot crop. It was, they were experimenting with it down in, in Mexico at, at least 6,000 years ago and probably earlier. It wasn't until about um, 44, 4,500 years ago that it it made, had some genetic changes and it became productive enough to really spend the time to plant and cultivate and, and that return on energy that you've invested in it was much more than, than uh, what it cost you to keep the plants going and growing. So 
when it reached that level of productivity, it spread actually fairly fast down into South America and up into the Southwest. So by about 4,100 years ago, again, documented there at uh, Congress Street, uh, we have strong evidence for them uh, growing maize. And to tie this into the modern <clears throat> environment that you can get out there and walk around on, the streetcar, when it starts later this year, is going to have its <coughs> excuse me, western terminus over there next to the Mercado. And if you go into the Mercado and uh, they have a little platform uh, up on top of the, the Augustine's restaurant there, you can go up on the second story, sort of look over the roof uh, towards the west, and you see these orange roofs. And so the parking lot between the Mercado building and those orange rooftops is where this 4,100-year-old um, uh, settlement was, where the first maze was, was documented here in Tucson. So uh, keep that in mind as you get off the, the uh, streetcar, which I hope you'll be um, enjoying in the not-too-distant future, and uh, experience some of these places um, that have been revealed to us through this project. Um, actually on the, on the ground. We jump forward in time to about 800 BC to the scanning phase of the early agricultural period. And we find lots and lots of big houses from that time period scattered throughout the area. Um, one thing to note is that we were digging in areas that had not been disturbed by the brick factory that was there in the 1890s. So we were somewhat constrained, but even beneath the floors of the brick factory, we were finding early agricultural pit houses. And in many of them, we find the central storage pits where they had built a fire when the house was being constructed and fired the walls of the pit because they were very clay rich to make them hard so they could store their corn surplus and their corn seeds for the future in there. We also found two of the big houses, the ceremonial houses, one up near where the brickyard was, and a particularly interesting one in the Mission Garden area. That house had a stone pillar or column in one corner of the house. And coincidentally, the University of Arizona was doing a big up on the top of Tumac Hill, and they found the first identical uh, big house up there with another stone column, uh, something that had never been known before. We were not quite sure what the purpose of this column was. It wasn't architectural. It was sitting inside the wall a certain way. And the top is uh, the one that we had that had worked in some ways. So maybe it was an altar? We don't know. And then jumping forward to uh, a little bit further ahead to the early ceramic period in the Mission Garden, we found about six or seven houses from the early ceramic period. One of the houses uh, was a storage house where there were five large storage jars sitting on the floor, all smashed up. And once you got these storage jars in place, a couple things happened. You don't have to dig exterior storage pits for your crops because it's much safer to put it inside a jar and seal it up with a, a sure disc for a lid. And uh, the other thing was, uh, Mike Hill noticed that they were focusing almost entirely their efforts on corn at that time period. Uh, one other thing that was found in one of the early ceramic houses was a set of bone gaming pieces that are in the picture in your uh, uh, newsletter. And those are sort of a couple of one thing that they had never been found previously in Tucson for that time period. So we set the stage for pre-contact archaeology and it, we went from that 4,100 years ago to about say five to 700 AD and there are there are different places there are um, multiple you know places that were investigated but after about 700 AD, we see much less in the archaeology about out there. Some of it may have been uh, attenuated by plowing and damaged in that, that way. But the other, Homer mentioned that there was settlement on the east side of the river, up on the terrace by the Art Museum, City Hall, that area. And that may be where the population concentrated a little later on, after 700 AD or so. So we're going to leave the pre-contact uh, era and move forward into the other two pieces that were supposed to be the uh, interpretive centers of, of the Rio Nuevo project, and the Presidio and the um, mission complex over the base of A Mountain. So Homer will take that on. I'm going to jump back. One thing I forgot to mention is that 
Chip Scott talked about was some of the artifacts that were found during the project. Projectile points, spearheads that resembled those found in northern Arizona and western New Mexico, suggesting a movement of people. Some of them were made from materials that were found in those areas. As well, uh, Chris Lang looked at the shell artifacts, and they were they were all uh, almost all uh, manufactured items. We weren't finding any evidence for manufacturing on the sites, and so somebody and these were California uh, shells. Someone was walking from California. California to Tucson with whole shell ornaments and they were coming from uh, other places with these projectile points so it's suggesting a lot of movement of people and then in contrast the ceramics were basically this uh, there's a sort of continuity from beginning up into the Holocom period and that may suggest that the, the, while the men were wandering around and moving that the women were staying in place. Let's jump forward to the mission, the, uh, the Presidio I guess. Uh, well, everyone knows the story. In 1775, an Irish guy employed by the Spanish military uh, selected the site of the Tucson Presidio on the East Terrace overlooking the Santa Cruz. The soldiers came up the following year in uh, 1776. Beginning in 1992, I started looking for portions of the Presidio and found sections of the wall first in the courthouse courtyard, where if you go there, there's a little strip in the, in the um, on the sidewalk running through the middle of the courthouse and then we found a portion of it in the lawn on the west side of City Hall as well as the uh, Presidio Blacksmith shop in that area. When we went to the parking lot at the corner of Church in Washington, that area had been previously partially excavated in 1954 by the University of Arizona where they uncovered a big thick adobe wall and then perhaps unfortunately they found a pit house and you know Emil Howery and those people they were more interested in the pit house and so they so that wall who cares and they started uh, focusing on the pit house uh, a guy named George Chambers who was in charge of the Tucson newspapers uh, tried to create interest in the whole project um, and begged the people to preserve it as a park, but that did not happen. And on December 28th, 1954, they backfilled everything and paved over, and, that, and that, actually that pavement helped preserve the site. So when we came in in 2002, the first thing we did was reopen the area where the pit house had been uh, because we wanted to uh, accurately map it. And on that day, the first day of work, uh, this guy named Avi Buckles that was working for me said, are, are we going to find a, a time capsule? And I'm like, no one finds a time capsule. And an hour later, he found a time capsule. <laughs> so I called up Bill, and I said, Bill, we found a time capsule. And he's like, so? And I'm like, no, we found a time capsule. Call up the city and tell them. And then he calls me back and said, you didn't open it up, did you? And I'm like, no, it's still sitting right there. And two days later, we had a time capsule opening ceremony <laughs> with uh, the mayor and city councilman uh, Fred Ronstadt and Louis Ibera, I think? Gutierrez. Jose. Jose Barra, yeah. yeah. And uh, I opened the lid and I told the mayor not to drag, he was reaching to pull the envelope. I said, careful. So he opened it up and read it, and what did it say? <laughs> it's a somewhat disheveled piece of stationery from Tucson Newspaper Incorporated uh, with George Chambers' uh, he heading on it, and it says, to whomever may be as much concerned as I and more successful in arousing public interest in the importance of preserving this historic site. So, uh, beautiful message. So if you, if you want to find a message from the past, that's a great thing to find. The other thing, uh, we, when we did the additional excavations, one day, I like to get in the holes and dig around, and I pull out a sherd, and uh, it's on display at the Presidio Park in the artifact display case. It, it says, think of me. And that was perhaps one of my most favorite things to find, because it's, that's what archaeologists do. They think about people in the past. So we excavated, we uncovered the location, discovered that the thick wall that had been found in 1954 was a tower. The plan was then to rebuild that corner and they offset the tower from the original location. And you can go there now, it's the Presidio Park. They have uh, uh, the Presidio Trust on uh, Saturdays. In fact, um, this particular Saturday, they're having their living history program and they fire the cannon and they have people uh, spinning uh, cotton into thread and cooking foods and a blacksmith and other people recreating uh, things. How many people here have been to the Presidio Park? Well, if you haven't been to the park, shame on you. 
I think we need to mention um, kind of the role that a, a gentleman named, a local architect named Lewis Hall played in focusing people's attention on the Tucson Presidio. I didn't really agree with some of his strategies for in uh, building walls all around downtown, but I think that his energy uh, really kind of stimulated a lot of interest uh, prior to Rio Nuevo, and it, it caused the, the ground penetrating radar work that was done to try to see could we look under the ground without excavating first in this downtown area uh, stimulated that interest and that, that even kind of set the stage for what uh, came afterwards with the Rio Nuevo, really focused attention on what was under all these layers of, of downtown Tucson. So, uh, and we, we want to be nicer to Emil Howery, come on. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was true that once they found the pit house, that wall just got ignored. Yeah. That's all right, because in some ways, it, 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 if they'd messed around with the wall more, they might have damaged it. <laughs> so, jumping over back to the mission site. So, Father Camillo came to the mission in the 1690s. He uh, selected it as a visita or visiting mission of San Javier in 1700. Uh, there was a priest that lived there for a few months in 1757 or so until he got sick and the Native Americans got sick of him. Uh, they asked for a church to be built in 1771. Uh, when they finished San Javier, they came up and they completed the complex with a two-story convento building, a church, a granary, walls surrounding the area, walled cemeteries, and a near 400 feet away at Mission Gardens. Uh, when the first uh uh, well, when John Russell Bartlett sat on top of uh, Sentinel Peak and made a drawing of the area, and the church was still standing at that time. By 1880, a guy named Carlton Watkins took a photograph looking down the church. You can just see the sort of stubs of the walls. And then there's a whole series of photographs as the uh, convento structure and the granary sort of fall apart. And in the 1950s, the city decided that would be a great location for a landfill. The uh, university came down and did, a, a, between 1949 and 1956, a series of very quick uh, uh, excavations. In one case, they used prisoners from the Pima County Jail to do the archaeology. And then the, the big question when we came out there was, was the convento and the chapel were they destroyed? There were these rumors going around that the guy that was in charge of the landfill had purposely preserved them in place. And so we started digging trenches and at the location of where the convento and chapel were supposed to be, we found landfill going down 25 to 30 feet. Uh, and the amazing thing was, uh, you, you know, we, we dig with our backhoe and we pull up old phone books and we were able to sit there and go through and we, they were perfectly preserved and we could look up Emil Howery's phone number from 19 <laughs> 1955. But so a large portion of the mission had been destroyed, but we did find the granary on the west side, uh, the wall of the uh, west compound, the north cemetery where the Native Americans buried was preserved, and we left that alone. The burials are still sitting there, preserved in place. We found trash middens where there was refuse discarded by the Native Americans. One of the cool things that we found was a uh, effigy jar of a, of a naked woman. She's sitting crouched down with her hands like this, and it's a Native American religious item at a Catholic mission, and so the Native Americans, they were still practicing their traditional uh, religious practices. What else did we find? We found uh, the first pit house from that time period, uh, right lined up with the Presidio wall, and in the handout, the single piece of paper handout, there is an artist's reconstruction of that. Over on the Mission Gardens, we found that the walls foundations were intact and we were able to excavate three sides with the fourth side underneath Mission Road. And in the years since, uh, the Mission Garden walls have been reconstructed, set offset so that the original ones are preserved in place. And we have people here from the Mission Garden. Uh, and you can go out there on Saturdays between 8 o'clock and noon, is that correct? Uh, noon to 4. Noon to 4 now. And uh, about half of the garden has been replanted. This is a nonprofit group from community members. And you can see the, the beautiful fruit trees, the grapevines. There is a timeline garden. There are uh, 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 sort of on the back wall, it's sort of like a native vegetation area. And there's plans to finish that in the relatively near future.
We're sharing the stage with another part of the story here. Uh, Doug Gann is silently uh, <clears throat> behind the speaker there for some of you, but um, the role that Doug and his digital technology played in this whole uh, Rio Nuevo project is a very important part of the story. Palmer mentioned that the two-story convento was, it was the landfill process was moving northward and they were about to take out the area where the last remnants of, of the uh, convento and the uh, chapel were and that's when Bill Wasley from the State Museum got the prison labor for one week to do this really talk about salvage archaeology and working in front of the bulldozers. This was like one of the worst case stories of that. So, but I had always thought that the, that the plan map that, that Wasley made was probably the most reliable source of what, what is the footprint of that, that convento. It turned out that that was not the case. Um, Doug compiled every stinking photograph from, you know, almost 50 or, or more years of, of photography of the sort of the decline of that um, <clears throat> mission complex. He put that together with his digital uh, skills and interestingly we also brought in a person who actually made physical models and he used the kind of data that Doug had compiled with his digital strategy and he came in one day and said, Doug, And Doug is di digitally reconstructed. You can do walkthroughs. There's a landscape that it's set in. And it's now modeling what's underground out there. So I think that's been a really important element of uh, you know, progress in, in how to do archaeology, how to interpret uh, what we, we find. And on the Presidio side of the downtown, his modeling uh, options as to how the the reconstruction might take place uh, was in sort of an interactive, uh, so that was another important role of bringing this digital technology to the project. So uh, thank you, Doug, for all you put into that. <laughs> there were some. <laughs> uh, briefly, the territorial period, uh, down at the Presidio Park, we had interesting work where we actually dug underneath the floors of a house built in the 1860s and 1870s in July when it was 108 degrees. That was a fun project. There was a woman that lived in that house named Soledad Hakame, and we, I did the genealogical research. She was a seamstress. Uh, she died from heart disease, and amazingly enough, the big refuse pit in the backyard contained all these sewing-related artifacts and bottles of heart medicine. Medication. Over at the uh, mission site in the territorial period, we had a well filled with Chinese artifacts discarded by Chinese gardeners that lived out there in the 1890s. And uh, when you go to the historical society, to the exhibit, they have a reproduction of the well and you can see the artifacts uh, on display that were recovered from there. Um, one of the things that was found was that uh, about 9,000 pieces of animal bone. Early on, they were raising uh, lots of uh, pigs. Um, they were also eating food imported from China because the Chinese people that lived here at that time, it was very important for them to maintain their traditional uh, eating and uh, uh, practices, including the dishes that they ate off of. And they ate a very diverse diet. And one of the things that was, uh, our faunal analyst, Jenny Waters, likes cats, and there were cats with cleaver marks on their heads. So they were eating a little bit of everything. Let's try to wrap it up here. Um, <laughs> not a cat taco either. So, um, I, I stepped into that one without. <laughs> Jack, you wanted us to entertain you, so we're trying. <laughs> what we have 
is now some opportunities out there. The, the, as Homer has, has highlighted, the Presidio Northeast Corner has been reconstructed. Uh, the Tucson Presidio Trust folks have really adopted that place. They're, they are, I think, one of the um, really positive outcomes of this, this process. In some earlier presentations way back when I was advocating for the Rio Nuevo, Rio Nuevo project, looking backwards, it was always people had great ideas about how to, to protect and, and preserve Tucson's history, but there was never enough money to do it. Rio Nuevo looked like it was going to bring the necessary money, um, but it didn't play out the way we had hoped. Um, but what has happened through this process, there's been enough sort of engagement by our community members to really come into these places and say, we're going to make us, the community, uh, the owners of this place, and we're going to give uh, our all to make this thing work. The same thing has happened over with the Mission Garden. The Friends of, of Tucson's Birthplace have also stepped up. They've raised money. They've organized uh, activities out there. They're, they're, uh, both of these two things, I think, are some of the most successful elements of outcome of, of the Rio Nuevo. It's truly community-based um, activities, place-based education is, is happening here in Tucson. So I think that's a really positive note to, to end on. And to get you out there uh, walking and seeing some of these places, if you haven't been out and crossed the Cushing Street Bridge, there's a lot of the community history that's actually been built into that bridge now. So as you go from the downtown over to uh, visit the Mercado area to see where those 4,000 year old pit houses are, cross that bridge, go down to the Mission um, Garden and see what's going on down there. So there's, there's a lot out there. Uh, go up on top of a mountain and look at it from that perspective. Uh, it's changing. Uh, there's still a lot more to go, but uh, having been involved with this for 15 years, there's some sadness in the way the path has gone, but there's also still a lot of optimism. So uh, that's sort of what we want to advance here tonight. Also, if you go downtown, uh, you'll see a turquoise line painted throughout downtown. And the Presidio Trust has put together uh, a map that you can pick up in the Tucson Visitor Center, and it's called the Turquoise Trail, and it lets you walk around downtown and see all the historic sites that are identified. And uh, I drive through downtown every day to work, and during the winter, you see so many people walking around holding that sign, or that uh, uh, map, especially uh, tourists from uh, outside of uh, uh, I'm told that every person in Canada has been through there. <laughs> so Doug's going to open us up to uh, questions now. Uh, I noted your comment about the maze um, having some kind of a genetic uh, transformation that made it more useful to, to farm. And I wonder if you could explain how that genetic uh, change might have occurred. <laughs> I think that's beyond my training here. Um, the I better not venture off because I might give you misinformation. The and if Homer's an historical archaeologist, I won't. Well, there's something about the earliest maize is like popcorn varieties. Yes, I mean it. It. Yeah, that's about all we know. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, um, out at the Las Capas site, the corn cobs are about this this big, and of course they're shrunk slightly because they're carbonized. But the uh, actual corn itself, it probably wasn't producing a huge amount per cob. No, that you're seeing the effects of specialization. We're, we work as a team. We have a special botanical analyst who handles a lot of these issues, and uh, we have to beg ig ignorance on that one. Sorry. We got to do better next time, Homer. <laughs> Here's one I know you can get. We'd like to hear some more about the Hohokam uh, canals that are on the west side of the river. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the, the Hohokam evidence? 
if you look at a map of the area there from, if you, you think of yourself driving north on Mission Road and you, you come right up next to the base of A Mountain and uh, then the, the land on your right um, sort of opens up so you have this sort of triangular shaped piece. Um, right there uh, where Mission Road comes around the corner would be the probably the ideal place to take off canals and if you look we didn't work down there because the uh, all the landfill um, activity had started down there and, and it just wasn't accessible but when we got up to the mission garden uh, the number of canals that are present in there and they're present from every time period we have them from the early agricultural time period uh, so from about 3,000 years old right up to the uh, historic and proto-historic and historic. So there, there is every time period represented. What happened over time was folks moved out of the floodplain early on from that 2100 BC up to the 700 or so AD. That's where people were actually living down on the floodplain proper. A little later on, you see them living up higher on, on terraces. Was was the canal on the east side? Um, there was a Hoakam canal over there at the yeah, right below the Presidio as well, right? Yeah, there were there are canals on both sides. The one right close to the base of Sentinel Peak is about uh, 20 feet wide and eight feet deep. I think it's the largest of the Hoakam canals known in the Tucson Basin. Could have taken basically the whole flow of the Santa Cruz River uh, through that that canal. And th these canals were present up until the 1910s. And I live on Paloma Street over <coughs> next to A Mountain. And the houses across the street from me are built on top of the Acequia Madre Segunda, the second major canal. And as you drive down, you can see the U-shaped crack in the brick walls of the house where they're settling down into the canal. <laughs> By the Manning House, um, there were excavations done there and there was a Hoakam Canal in that area that pr probably projecting it northward went all the way up to about Grant Road. So there's, there were substantial, as time went on, the early canals were relatively short, but with time the length of canals uh, was, uh, became greater and they were probably uh, integrating more than a single community. Even two or three communities might have been uh, using uh, canals, yeah. the same canal, excuse me. I just wanted to toot Homer's horn a little bit uh, regarding the construction, reconstruction of the Presidio. Of course, he was in charge of the excavation, but then the question, you know, really came, well, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to rebuild this thing? And what, exactly what do we have in mind? And there were, of course, lots and lots of discussions as any project like this that's run by a governmental entity, in this case the city. So committees and committees and committees. But it was really Homer who on, I forgot if it was the back of the envelope or the back of a napkin, sketched out the wall and the quarters and what we ultimately ended up building. And then the other person here who really should get a lot of credit for seeing that that happened is Bill O'Malley sitting right there. Raise your hand, Bill. <laughs> Bill worked for the city at the time and he had the very difficult job of running a committee for what was it a year and a half for two years once a week with a bunch of cranky folks including the architect and the contractor and me and others and managed to keep it all going and get the thing built and he really did a tremendous job. I don't think it would have happened without the two of them. Um, I guess, Homer, I believe you said that uh, uh, there was was slow on the Santa Cruz. And I had actually understood that it was more of a Cianico with a general flow. Could you kind of go into that a little bit? Well, I uh, had to wade across the river in the 1880s and 1890s. There's a the story of a guy named Albert Reynolds uh, who was visiting the town and he was interested in mission and went up to the town of He was told, oh, um, go over there and see you both. Up. And he went over there and it wasn't until he got to Conway Mountain he had a But he saw dark pictures photographs showing him walking there for 
a lot of the water was running through the canals, though, so it wasn't like a huge impressive. And the entire river system is not, I mean, from its headwaters to uh, the north end of Tucson, it would not have had flow all that way. It's an intermittent flow where the water sometimes is just flowing below ground. It's the, it's the bedrock masses like down at Sonic Beer or at a mountain that force the water up to the, to the surface. And the, I mean, they, were, they came out like springs and they're tapped by the irrigation canals. We, we were actually hoping to bring the, the so-called Watson's photograph. It's, it's a, in a very small version on page two of the, the uh, Archaeology Southwest magazine that you have. That's the view from, 18, from A Mountain in 1880. And you see that uh, agrarian landscape there. And in a larger version, you can see along all of those irrigation canals are bushes that are covered with actively doing their laundry along the the canals there. So you, it's very difficult to see where the channel of the Santa Cruz is there it was not deeply incised like it is today. That happened a decade or a little more than a decade after this photo. All right, I'd like to thank our speakers. Uh,